Hello, uh, my name is Marcello Cilia and I'm a geologist with the US Geological Survey uh, Earthquake Science Center in Menlo Park, California. And today I am very pleased to talk to you all about the 2018 Palu liquefaction and landslides. Okay, so here is the outline for the talk. Um, so I will briefly introduce uh, different types of mass movements uh, and the influences of certain natural forces. Um, but we will focus mainly on liquefaction, um, understand a bit more about the soil mechanics behind this um, and the relationship to magnitude. Then finally, we will discuss the link between uh, ground motions and soil liquefaction and use Japan as a comparative study. So, on a very broad scale, uh, there are many different kinds of mass movements, uh, including different types of landslides, uh, as well as many forms of liquefaction, as you can see here in the diagram. Okay, so for landslides, uh, really, no matter what the type, the role of uh, gravity is important to understand. So here we can see two slopes with two different masses. Um, but we want to focus on the downward force, uh, the downslope force, which is the pull of gravity, which is shown as FD, uh, and also the resistance force to friction, uh, which is FR. So quite simply, when the resistance force is greater than the force of gravity, the mass will stay as it is. But when the force of gravity is uh, greater than the mass, uh, excuse me, greater than the resistance force, then the landslide will happen. And these forces can be changed by uh, natural and human events, as we see here. Okay, so when water is introduced, things can become uh, a bit more complicated. So if the groundwater, uh, Fg in this case, uh, rises but stays below what is called the glide horizon, which is essentially the surface between the unstable mass uh, and the solid mass, then that is okay. But if the groundwater rises above the glide horizon, uh, then this is when the slope, flip, the slope uh, is likely to fail. So the water table can change uh, for various reasons. Uh, for example, long periods of rainfall, uh, tectonic changes, um, but actually uh, also a big human impact is over cultivation of agricultural land, uh, which is also what we see in the case of Palu and will be discussed further later. And this is just a nice diagram to summarize the relationship between uh, shear stress and shear strain and uh, the different stages, uh, pre and post slope failure. So as you can see, um, it starts off with elastic behavior, uh, becomes more plastic um, in its uh, behavioral properties, uh, and then eventually goes into the post failure uh, stage. Okay, so let's move on to liquefaction itself. So what is liquefaction? Now, this term was originally used all the way back in 1918 by an American engineer called Alan Hazen. Um, and he actually used this in reference to the failure of the Calaveras Dam in California. And it was actually only after this, only after the uh, 1964 Great Alaska earthquake that this term became uh, used uh, more commonly uh, and was then related to earthquakes. So what is liquefaction then in terms of earthquakes? So in general, uh, we're talking about a partially or fully saturated uh, soil, uh, which substantially which substantially loses strength and stiffness because of an external stress that is applied, for example, an earthquake. 
And it's this sudden change in stress condition that actually causes the soil to behave like a liquid. So this diagram here nicely illustrates uh, that the presence of water here causes the grains to lose contact with each other, which is why they can flow more like a fluid or more like a liquid. Okay, so first we need to understand a few important concepts um, used a lot in soil mechanics. So these are total stress, poor water pressure, effective stress, and shear strength. And some of you may already be familiar with this uh, and the next few slides, if you have watched the previous lecture six on the 2018 Palu earthquake and tsunami, but we will just go through it for those of whom have not watched it. Okay, so first let's look at the relationship between total stress and effective stress. So if we look at this diagram, the total stress is everything in this rectangle, okay? Um, so the accumulated forces acting on the soil. And the big yellow circles are the soil particles. Uh, and then the poor water pressure is the blue state, uh, which is uh, in between the soil particles. So when we consider total stress in a soil, we would add the effective stress uh, to the poor water pressure. Uh, and so this accounts for all internal forces acting on the soil from different directions. And then for the effective stress, we would subtract um, everything in the rectangle by the blue space or the poor water pressure. And this is the formula here. And it's also important to note that if, uh, is, if, if, if you are below the water table, then the poor water pressure is uh, positive. Uh, but above the water table, when the soil is saturated, uh, poor water pressure is uh, negative. And in dry soil, the poor pressure would be zero. So now let's look at shear strength. So for shear strength, we consider this formula here. Um, so C uh, in this case is uh, cohesion, uh, but also on a diagram, it's essentially the given value for the intercept of the straight line on the shear stress axis, um, and then added to the total stress uh, multiplied by the tan of the angle of internal friction. Um, and this angle can, you know, encompass many different types of angles and have many different values. And that essentially tells us when shear failure is likely. But to consider a more realistic situation, we want to include effective stress in the formula because it considers the impact of water on the soil. So here we would replace the total stress with the effective stress instead. Okay, so what about during ground, uh, excuse me, during ground shaking? Well, further to this, we would in this case want to consider a hydrostatic condition where there is no water flow. Um, which results from the weight of any material uh, measured above any given point, uh, which is shown as UDN here. Um, and this is also known as a static pool pressure. And when we add this to the overall pool pressure, uh, we get this here, which is sigma n. And of course, we need to consider uh, the type of soil where ground shaking occurs. Uh, and for Palu City, this actually sits on deep alluvial soil layers uh, deposited by Palu River. So we get a lot of loose sand and silt. So here, the C value is likely to be closer to zero. So overall, when we combine all of these factors, uh, we will use this formula for shear strength. And uh, apologies, this uh, DYN should actually be a, uh, a subscript, so it should be in uh, the, the lower case here.
Okay, so at what exact point does liquefaction occur? Well, it's essentially the point when the effective stress of the soil is reduced to zero, which corresponds with a complete loss of shear strength. And just a note here that this rarely happens in places of uh, gravity of clay and most likely will occur in sandy or non-plastic uh, silty soils. So this is just a nice summary diagram of what can happen to the soil layers uh, during ground shaking from an earthquake. And we can see a few physical features that are shown on the surface of the soil, uh, excuse me, down here, uh, such as sand boils. And in the case of the 2018 Palu earthquake, um, there were extreme examples of severe liquefaction throughout various villages, two of which are displayed here. So on the right here, uh, this is about 10 kilometers south of Palu city. We can see extensive lateral spreading on one of the main roads. Uh, and uh, another village here, uh, Potobo, uh, which is uh, also just outside of Palu city, which you can see was completely inundated um, by uh, soil liquefaction and landslides. Here are some further examples of soil liquefaction, uh, both of which are in Balaroa village, which is about two to three kilometers west of Palu city. Uh, and you can see here large vertical displacements on the roads up to 2.25 meters high. And also we can see lateral spreading um, on the image on the right. Okay, so Two surveys were conducted to assess the ground shaking and tsunami effects, uh, one by BMKG and one by myself. Uh, and I would actually like to thank BMKG for their very helpful assistance. So the combined study, um, sorry, just a second. So the combined study can actually be seen here on the map in this red box. And this is just a zoomed in map of all of uh, the study areas. Okay, so three main areas were identified that experienced extreme liquefaction. So Balaroa, Petobo, and Junegi Sedera, all of which are shown in the red shaded regions on the map here. So the next few slides will be before and after satellite images of these three liquefaction areas, starting with Balaroa. So the before image is taken from 16th of August 2018 and the one afterwards is taken on 1st of October, which is three days after the main shock, um, which occurred on September 28th, 2018. So the inundation area has been outlined in red here. And as you can see, the landslide in this case traveled from west to east with an average slope angle of 2.6 degrees. And this is just a reminder of where Balavara is located here, the uh, calculated patch of liquefaction and relative, and where it is located relative to Palu City. Okay, so next we have Pitoba. So an interesting change here, uh, as you can see, there is a difference in direction of inundation from east to west instead, uh, with an average slope angle of 2.4 degrees. And Potobo is located about eight kilometers uh, southeast of Palu city. And interestingly, uh, quite far away from the Palu Koro fault here um, compared to Balaroa, which we will also discuss in another lecture. Lastly, we have the village of Junogo Sedera. And as you can probably tell, um, this village has the largest liquefaction area um, which had a, a maximum slope angle of 10 degrees, which was measured around this area here. And this inundated area was located furthest um, from Palu City. 
So part of the BMKG survey also included a microzonation survey with soil profiles and average shear wave velocity of these three liquefied areas. And here's a summary of the results. So we can see that the soil profiles were mainly dominated with sands and silts, and as expected, um, soft soils and soft rock also were found to be dominant in the areas that experienced the most extreme soil liquefaction. So if you look at the bigger picture for a second, we can see that actually there is a positive linear relationship that has been derived between magnitude and epicentral distance of liquefied sites. Um, and in this case, this was a study for Japan. So in some examples up to magnitude eight earthquakes, we can see liquefaction was generated at sites close to 200 kilometers away from the epicenter. So an interesting question is that if we know this type of relationship exists between magnitude and liquefaction, let's take a step further and think about whether predicted ground motions can tell us anything about liquefaction potential. So as you may know, there were no seismic stations during the Palu earthquake and we do not have any ground motion data. So interestingly, in 2017, a few maps were published, um, which were to provide an update to the 2012 Indonesia, excuse me, Indonesian seismic code. So here is one of the maps, um, which is the mapped PGA for Indonesia, or predicted PGA. And if we look at Palu, we can see that the mapped PGA is around 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 G, uh, which is a high value. And in the surrounding areas of the alluvial valley, it's lower, about 0.6 uh, G. Another one of the maps was for the 0 0.2 second short period spectral acceleration, which has been mapped as 1.2 to 1.25 G. Um, and if you wanted to take a closer look at the response spectra, then these values could be particularly helpful. And lastly, we have the one second period spectral acceleration map, which for Palu and its surrounding areas have been given a range from 1 to 1.0.5 G. Now, by themselves, the values may not mean very much. So let us compare this with another big earthquake that we know generated extreme soil liquefaction. And in this case, we will look at the magnitude 9 Great Tohoku earthquake, which happened on March 11th, 2011. And as you can see, here is the uh, epicenter of the earthquake. So you may be thinking that Tohoku earthquake was very different to the Palu earthquake, um, which is actually true in many ways. Firstly, uh, the Tohoku earthquake occurred offshore in a subduction zone setting. And also the finite fault model shows a rupture greater than 300 kilometers with a maximum slip of about 54 meters. And for Palu, the rupture was approximately 150 kilometers with a maximum slip of about 6.5 meters. But what is particularly interesting is the evidence of surface liquefaction outside of this rupture zone and where seismic stations were located relative to this. So we will be looking at this area here. Okay, so here we can see uh, mapped areas with different levels of liquefaction but we are actually just going to look at these stations that are circled here in dark blue because these are the sites which showed evidence of extensive surface liquefaction um, with ground excuse me with ground failure and these two stations in particular have been described as uh, having experienced severe liquefaction so what's interesting is the recorded PGA values at all four sites, 
range from 0.12 to 0.26. So well, why does this matter? What does this mean? Now, not only have similar descriptions been observed, both for the Tohoku event and for the Palu earthquake, but the evidence of liquefaction in Japan occurred at much lower PGA values than what has been mapped for Palu. So up to 2.6 for Japan and predicted 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 for Palu. So lastly, if we look more closely at the actual soil profile and the average shear wave velocity at the four stations in Japan, which we can see in figure C here, um, we can start to see that there is some similarity and consistency um, with the values, with the minimum values, um, at least found in Banaroa and Junogo Sidera, when we get you know, to around the 20, 10 meters to 20 meters depth range. So there are some similarities. But overall, you know, the effects of the liquefaction and landslides were the most damaging um, for several reasons um, in the case of Palu. And a strong link has been made between land usages, such as primary rice cultivation, um, as, being the biggest con excuse me, as being the biggest contributor to the extreme liquefaction observed. But what's also important is understanding how to update and factor in these complex high risks into future hazard maps. And if we can compare other earthquakes that have had similar effects as seen in Palu, then we can better understand liquefaction potential as a whole. So thank you very much for your time. And I hope you enjoyed uh, this lecture on the 2018 Palu uh, landslides and liquefaction.